So this is the same reading, but it's just, it might just be a little bit better quality so of sound. So we'll give it a try. And this one will go all the way through to the end of the chapter. Afraid in her extreme perturbation of the loneliness of the deserted rooms of the half-imagined faces peeping from behind every open door in them, Miss Post got a basin of cold water and began laving her eyes, which were swollen and red. Haunted by her feverish apprehensions, she could not bear to have her sight obscured for a minute at a time by the dripping water, but constantly paused and looked round to see that there was no one watching her. In one of those pauses, she recoiled and cried out, for she saw a figure standing in the room. The basin fell to the ground broken, and the water flowed at the feet of Madame Defarge. By strange, stern ways, and through much staining of blood, those feet had come to meet that water. Madame Defarge looked coldly at her and said, The wife of every moment? Where is she? It flashed upon Miss Cross's mind that the doors were all standing open and would suggest the flight. The first act was to shut them. There were four in the room, and she shut them all. She then placed herself before the door of the chamber which Lucy had occupied. Madame Defarge's dark eyes followed her through this rapid movement, and rested on her when she was finished. Miss Cross had nothing beautiful about her. Years had not tamed the wildness, or softened the grimness of her appearance, but she too was a determined woman in her different way, and she measured Madame Defarge with her eyes every you might, from your appearance, be the wife of Lucifer, said Miss Cross in her breathing. Nevertheless, you shall not get the better of me. I am an Englishwoman. Madame Defarge looked at her scornfully, but still with something of Miss Cross's own perception, that the two were at bay. She saw a tight, hard, wiry woman before her, as Mr. Lorry had seen, in the same figure, in a woman with a strong hand and ears gone by. She knew full well that Miss Cross was the family's devoted friend. Miss Cross knew full well that Madame Defarge was the family's malevolent enemy. On my way yonder, said Madame Defarge, with a slight movement of her hand toward the fatal spot, where they reserve my chair and my knitting for me, I am come to make my compliments to her in passing. I wish to see her. I know that your intentions are evil, and you may depend upon it. I'll hold my own against them. Each spoke in her own language. Neither understood the other's words. Both were very watchful and intent to deduce from look and manner what the unintelligible words meant. It will do her no good to keep herself concealed from me at this moment. Good patriots will know what that means. Let me see her. Go tell her that I wish to see her, do you hear? If those eyes of yours were bedwinches and I was an English war poster, they shouldn't lose a splinter of me. No, you are a wicked foreign woman. I am your match. Madame Defarge was not likely to follow those idiomatic remarks in detail, but she so far understood them as to perceive. Woman, imbecile and pig-like, said Madame Defarge, frowning. I take no answer from you. I demand to see her. Either tell her that I demand to see her, or stand out of the way of the door and let me go to her. This with an angry, explanatory wave of her right arm. I little thought that I should ever want to understand your nonsense language, but I would give all I have, except the clothes I wear, to know whether you suspect the truth or any part of it. Neither of them for a single moment released the other's eyes. Madame Defarge had not moved from the spot where she stood when Miss Cross first became aware of her, but now she advanced. I am a Briton. I am French. I don't care an English tuppence for myself. I know that the longer I keep you here, the greater hope there is for my ladybird. I'll not leave a handful of that dark hair upon your head if you lay a finger on me. Thus Miss Cross, 
with a shake of her head and a flash of her eyes between every rapid sentence and every rapid sentence a whole breath. Thus, Miss Ross, who had never struck a blow in her life, but her courage was of all nature, that it brought the irrepressible tears into her eyes. This was a courage that Madame Defarge so little comprehended as to mistake it for weakness. Ha <laughs> ha! She laughed. You poor wretch! I address myself to the doctor. Then she raised her voice and called out, Citizen Doctor, wife of every mund, child of every mund, any person but this miserable fool, answer to Citizen Estefage. Perhaps the following silence, perhaps some latent disclosure and expression in Miss Boss's face, perhaps a sudden misgiving apart from either suggestion whispered to Madame Defarge that they were gone. She opened swiftly and looked in. Those rooms are her. There has been hurried packing. There are odds and ends upon the ground. There is no one in that room behind you. Let me look. Never, said Miss Cross, who understood the request as perfectly as Madame Defarge understood the answer. If they are not in that room, they are gone, and can be pursued, and brought Madame Defarge to herself. As long as you don't know whether they are in that room or not, sir, said Miss Cross to herself. And you shall not know that if I can prevent your knowing it. And know that, or not know that, you shall not leave here while I can hold you. I have been in the streets from the first. Nothing has stopped me. I will to pieces, but I will have you from that door, said Madame Defarge. We are alone at the top of a high house in a solitary courtyard. We are not likely to be heard. And I pray for bodily strength to keep you here while every minute you are here is worth a hundred thousand guineas to my darling, said Miss Peace. Madame Defarge made at the door. Miss Cross, on the instinct of the moment, raised her round the waist in both her arms and held her tight. It was in vain for Madame Defarge to stand to strike. Miss Cross, with the vigorous tenacity of love, always so much than hate clasped her tight, and even lifted her from the floor in the struggle that they had. The two hands of Madame Defarge buffeted and tore her face, but Miss Frost, with her head down, held her round the waist, and clung to her with more than the hold of a drowning woman. Madame Defarge had ceased to strike, and fell at her encircled waist. "'Tis under my arm," said Miss Frost in smothered tones. You shall not draw it. I am stronger than you. I bless heaven for it. I hold you till one or the other of us faints or dies. Madame Defarge's hands were at her bosom. Miss Cross looked up, saw what it was, struck at it, struck out a flash and a crash, and stood alone. Blinded with something. All this was in a second. As the smoke cleared, leaving an awful stillness, it passed out on the air like the soul of the furious woman whose body lay lifeless on the ground. In the first fright and horror of her situation, Miss Cross passed the body as far from it as she could and ran down the stairs to call for fruitless help. Happily, she thought of herself of the consequences of what she did, in time to check herself and go back. It was dreadful to go in at the door again, but she did go in, and even went right to get the bonnet and the other things that she must wear. These she put on, out on the staircase, first shutting and locking the door and taking away the key. Then she sat down on the stairs a few moments to breathe and to cry and got up and hurried away. By good fortune, she had a veil on her bonnet, or she could hardly have gone along the streets without being stopped. By good fortune, too, she was naturally so peculiar in her, her appearance as not to show disfigurement like any other woman. She needed both advantages, for the marks of the gripping fingers were deep in her face, and her hair was torn, and her dress, hastily composed with unsteady hands, was clutched and dragged a hundred ways. And crossing the bridge, she dropped the door key in the river. 
Arriving at the cathedral some few moments before her escort and waiting there, she thought, if the key were already taken in the net, for it were identified, what if the door were opened and the remains discovered? What if she was stopped at the gate, sent to prison, and charged with murder? In the midst of these fluttering thoughts, the escort appeared. The escort is um, Jerry Cruncher. Took her in and took her away. Is there any noise in the streets? She asked him. The usual noises, Mr. Cruncher replied, and looked surprised by the question and by her aspect. hear you what did you say it was in vain for mr cruncher to repeat what she said miss cross could not hear him so on all my head thought mr cruncher amazed at all events she'll see that and she did is there is there any noise in the streets now asked miss cross again pleasantly Again, Cruncher nodded his head. I don't hear it. Oh, dead in an hour, said Mr. Cruncher, ruminating with his mind much disturbed. What's come to her? I feel as if there has been a flash and a crash, and that crash was the last thing I shall ever hear in this life. Best if she ain't in a queer condition, said Mr. Cruncher, more and more disturbed. What could she been taking to keep her courage up? Huh? What's the role of them deaf gods? You can hear that, miss. I can hear nothing. Oh, good man, there was first a great crash and then a great stillness, and that stillness seemed to be fixed and unchangeable, never to be broken any more as long as my life lasts. She don't hear the role of those dreadful carts, now very nigh the journey's end. It's my opinion that, indeed, she never will hear anything else in this world. And, indeed, she never did.